Okay, hello everybody. Welcome back to the Forum webinar series. If you don't know Forum, we're the professional membership program of the National Trust for Historic Preservation. This webinar series is made possible by members of the Preservation Leadership Forum, and we sincerely thank those of you who are on with us today. So my name is Michelle Pryor. I'm the coordinator of publications and programs in our Preservation Resources Department, and I run this webinar series. For those of you who've attended our webinars in the past, I have taken over for Rebecca Weiss, and it's nice to virtually meet all of you today. Before we begin, I have a few technical things. You can download handouts from today's webinar directly from the header marked Handouts on your control panel. There you can find a PDF of today's slides. As for what to expect on today's webinar, first Diana Maxwell, our Grants Manager at the National Trust, will share what grants are available, what deadlines are coming up, and tips for your application. We will then move to questions from the audience. You should see an option to send questions to staff on your control panel. If you have questions during the webinar, you are welcome to submit them, but we will wait until the end to answer all questions. And with that, I would like to introduce today's speaker, Diana Maxwell, our Grants Manager at the National Trust. Thank you for being with us, Diana. Thanks, Michelle. Um, hello, everybody who's either listening live or listening to this uh, in the future uh, with a recording. Um, I always like to think that it's nice to put a face to the name. So that's what I like to, to start this presentation with. Uh, if you've ever emailed or if you've emailed or called our office in the last oh, six months or so, you likely talked to myself or Lizzie Berenger, who's the coordinator uh, for grants and awards in our department. And um, that's who we are. That's what we look like. So uh, we are located in Washington, D.C. in the Watergate office building, and uh, that's our contact information up on the screen, the um, email and uh, phone number, and then the website as well. Um, so today I'm just going to talk about um, a few different things. Um, first, why you should care about the forum. Um, then talk about our uh, National Trust Preservation Fund, and then our special funds, our grant application process, and uh, th that kind of goes for all of them. Um, and then I'm going to talk about the African American Cultural Heritage Action Fund briefly, um, that uh, some of you may have a big interest in, and then the National Fund for Sacred Places, um, which is another one of our, these two are separate, uh, they have sort of a different the way that you apply and a different, uh, um, they, they work differently than our other grants. So it's, it's good to talk about them separately. And then finally, we'll have some time for questions at the end. So first, why forum? Um, you're here today, hopefully you are a forum member. Um, forum is a membership level of the National Trust. Uh, we have about 2,200 members um, and basically a, a place for professional uh, professionals interested in preservation to sort of uh, be together. We offer networking and, um, uh, you know, inter interactive uh, sessions, things like this webinar. Um, and it's also probably most importantly, you have to be a forum member at the organizational level to be eligible for the grant funds. So this is $250 a year. Um, it's, it's something that your organization uh, needs to hold. Uh, and if it's a if someone in your organization has a, a an individual forum membership, um, they that can be upgraded to the organizational level membership uh, by speaking with someone in our membership office. So that's just sort of the the nice thing to get started. Um, and forum membership also comes with discounts for trainings for the conference, things like that. Um, so we'll kick it off with the National Trust Preservation Funds. This is our largest grant program. Uh, we have kind of, when we talk about National Trust Funds, this is sort of what we think of as our, our, our biggest program. Um, over a million dollars is available nationwide each year. Uh, you do need to be an, a nonprofit or government agency to be eligible for this grant and really for any of our grants. Uh, these are grants that are for planning preservation projects and for educational, planning educational activities. So, um, they're small grants. The idea is that it's a little bit of seed money to get you started. We found that it really can help an organization uh, get money from other sources by having that national trust kind of background uh, there. 
Um, they require a one-to-one -one cash match. This match can come from a foundation, an, an individual donor, uh, someone, funds that are on hand, um, but it does need to be cash. It can't be a uh, uh, in-kind donation or something like that. This grant fund has three deadlines a year, February 1st, June 1st, and October 1st, and so that's coming up pretty quickly, February 1st, and this application is live on our website. So all of our, for all of our grants, you apply through our online web portal, which if you go to our forum website, uh, you'll be able to find a link to that at the bottom of the grant pages, and you'll sign up there as a program called Foundant, and uh, we found it pretty, it's Pretty good to pretty easy to work through and and it's it's a good program for us and makes it easy for us to to uh, see your applications and uh, you can upload photos and, and things like that so everything um, is done through that system we don't take anything as a paper application so um, talking about sort of what these kind of projects could be for education and outreach these are preservation education programs or activities aimed at the public particularly programs uh, aimed at reaching new audiences. So innovative techniques and formats, um, conference sessions. We, the way we fund conferences is typically through uh, uh, paying for speaker fees. Um, we can't do a lot of other types of conference support, but typically through speaker fees is the way we do it. Um, and this example here was a, a tour that um, used Sort of uh, old, took, took folks through thank you, through Los Angeles. Uh, it went to the UCLA IM Lab um, for the IM Lab interpretive walk. Uh, it was a monthly thematic walk going through downtown Los Angeles and uh, a public website too. So uh, participants would be given a packet of cards featuring historic kind of photos of an area. You can see that black and white in the center, and then go through the exact those exact same locations so you could learn about the history of that site and also be in that site uh, presently. Um, for planning projects, this is you know, support for professional expertise for, for hiring consultants primarily, um, architectural consultants, engineering, archaeology, planning, um, law. You, know, you can see some of those kind of types of things up on the screen. Um, an example of this we gave a, a few years back was to the Chisholm Trail Heritage Museum in Texas, where uh, they applied for a grant for a historic structures report for uh, a school from the 1870s. So that's sort of the, 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 you know, the meat and potatoes of our grant program are these sort of smaller um, planning grants that are, are really useful and can be really effective in getting a project started. We also have some limited in emergency and intervention funding. Um, this is awarded for emergency situations, again, nonprofit organizations and public agencies. Uh, this can range from $1,000 to $5,000. And the important thing here is that no cash match is required. We understand, you know, if it's an emergency situation that it's likely you don't have a match on hand. Um, an example of this uh, would be a grant we gave to the Georgia Trust for Historic Preservation where uh, this building, uh, Gaines Hall at Morris Brown College, had burned. Um, and the intervention fund after the, the, the Georgia Trust came to us after the fire, and we were able to help them engage a structural engineer who designed a bracing system to support the original exterior walls, as well as a new interior, since the existing interiors weren't salvageable, and a roofing system. Um, and this building is just a, a few blocks away from the new Atlanta, or newish, I guess now, Atlanta Falcon Stadium, um, and the the economic sort of growth that's expected in that neighborhood bodes well for adaptive reuse of this building. So uh, we don't have a lot of information on emergency funding on our website, kind of on purpose. What we want you to do is to email us or call us if you think your project qualifies. Um, we we have sort of the funding is quite limited, so it's helpful for us to be able to talk to you about your project and um, what you require before. Uh, you know, kind of making a decision there. We don't want you to put in an application for something that's not going to be eligible. So uh, basically the first step for this is to send us an email, let us know the situation, what you're looking for, um, and we'll get back to you with the, there's an access code so that you're able to uh, uh, submit the application. So that is emergency funding. And then we do have several funds with special exceptions that uh, kind of are tied into 
the preservation fund as well. So all of these funds are part that you see on the screen are part of the National Trust Preservation Fund. You'd apply to any of these funds throughout the regular process. So you wouldn't be looking for specifically for the battlefield fund as a separate application. You're just applying to the preservation fund. Um, but these uh, funds are uh, located more, more information on all of these is located on our website. Generally, they're sort of geographically specific in like the Colorado and Hawaii funds. The battlefield fund is focused on funding battlefields. That's pretty straightforward, I think. Um, and then the Deutsch Memorial Fund for Rosenwald Schools is focused on Rosenwald Schools. Um, like I said, more information on our website. If you fit into one of those categories, I suggest you check that out. Uh, and again, you would just be, these have the, have the same deadlines and the same application as the preservation fund grants. So they would all be due the next deadline of May 1st, or excuse me, February 1st. So that was our National Trust Preservation Funds. And then now this next section focuses on some of the other special funds that have their own applications. Um, the first, and actually I lied because the Southwest Intervention Fund no longer has its own application. Um, but this fund is geographically uh, restricted. Um, to Arizona, Colorado, New Mexico, and West Texas and Utah, and it's a very specific definition of West Texas, which is on the website. I, if you're interested in this, check that out. Again, preservation planning efforts and responses to emergency threats. So it's very similar to the preservation fund grants. Um, you, will, you will still apply to the preservation fund um, through, that, through that application. Um, local partners, nonprofit organizations, and government agencies. The difference with this is that they can go up to $10,000 but otherwise uh, similar restrictions. So uh, an example of one of these we gave in New Mexico, um, used grant funds to stabilize a, an archeo archeological site um, that had well-preserved petroglyphs and a midden, um, but the, the masonry dwelling was in need of stabilization. So that's the kind of work that this fund can do. Um, it does need to have a connection to traditional cultures. So if you have questions about that, again, send us an email, give us a call. We're happy to talk through that with you. Uh, so now, the Joanna Favreau Fund for Historic Preservation, uh, this does have a separate application, a separate grant deadline. This is for planning, education, and brick and mortar grants. This is one of the few funds we have that does allow for physical preservation work. And the, um, the kind of amount that you can spend is a little bit higher. It goes up to $15,000. Still a one-to-one -one cash match still nonprofits and government agencies only, and the deadline for this is March 1st. So this application will be up uh, probably just after the first of the year, um, once, once we're back in the office after the holiday, uh, and you can, you can see that application there. Um, this only started last year allowing for brick and mortar grants, and it is a national fund, so it is pretty competitive. I would say more competitive than some of our other grants, but it is a good, it's a good opportunity to get that brick and mortar money. Uh, it is one of our donor advised funds, which means that the process for uh, choosing those grants takes a little bit longer. So the grant deadline is March 1st. You won't be notified of, of the results of the grant until July 1st. So it's, it's a little bit of a longer lead time there. An example of this one, uh, the photo on the screen is from Notre Dame of Maryland University in Baltimore. Um, and they used a Fabro grant to hire a preservation consultant to create a preservation plan for this building, Gibbons Hall, which housed the first Catholic college for women in the US to award a four-year degree. So that's the Favreau Fund. Uh, along with the Favreau Fund is the Cynthia Woods Mitchell Fund for Historic Interiors. And this is similar to the Favreau Fund in that it can do planning, education, and brick and mortar grants, but this is limited to the interior of a historic building. So this is focused on historic interiors. Again, it can go up to $15,000. The match requirements uh, are, are the same, same sort of applicants, same deadline, March 1st. Um, they, again, and also as competitive uh, as, as the Fabro Fund is. Um, so if you have questions about these, again, always happy to answer them. People some often ask, can I apply for both? Uh, you can apply for both in a round. However, you won't receive both grants. Um, we can only give one round, one grant per round. So I would suggest that you, in, uh, you know, apply for, put the application in for the one that's most pressing um, um, to your organization and maybe hold the next one until the, the following year. 
So uh, the project here that was funded by a Mitchell uh, Fund grant is at Texas A&M University, and they received a $10,000 grant to prepare a preservation plan for the decorative painting treatments of Scotts Hall, which is, uh, you can see those murals at the, at the photo of that screen. Another one uh, that we funded was in Charleston, um, where the grant helped uh, the Historic Charleston Foundation evaluate the plaster within the Aiken Rett House Museum's kitchen house using a combination of non-destructive infrared thermo thermography and traditional sounding methods. So we have some you know, interesting projects that come up through this, but again, it is limited to historic interiors. Um, another fund that is a little bit different from, from the preservation funds is the Hart Family Fund for Small Towns. In some ways, this is closer to the preservation funds than Favreau and Mitchell in that it is limited to planning and education grants. Uh, it's limited to projects in a with a small town sort of population that means for us that means less than 10,000 people. Uh, this fund can go up to $15,000 match requirements are the same uh, and the deadline for this fund is May 1st. So we, we typically try to have uh, applications open eight weeks before a deadline so this will be coming up uh, in another couple of months. Um, an example here is a, a town in, Col in California which supported a feasibility study for the reuse of a former Carnegie library uh, that was in good condition but just wasn't used anymore and the community wanted to kind of figure out what to do with it next. This next fund uh, moves away from sort of typical, uh, typical building grants. Um, the Peter Brink Leadership Fund is for mentoring basically and peer-to-peer -peer and uh, networking between preservation organizations. So uh, what this does is reimburse travel costs and honorariums for the mentor uh, up to $2,500. This is a rolling application, it's accepted throughout the year. Uh, and uh, the example here was for Preserve Granberry in Texas. And they had the Esther Hall, who was chair of the National Alliance of Preservation Commissions, travel there to mentor this group in leadership training and strategic planning. So they could sort of uh, work in this in this case it wasn't a one-on-one -on -one, it was sort of a one-on small group um, but we see that and and that works as well so if you have questions about this one this is an application that you do need an access code for the grants office can give you that access code send us an email or give us a call and we can um, you know just to talk through your project let us know who, who you you want to be mentored by or work with and then we can go from there. But this is a rolling admission, rolling application so there isn't a set deadline for this. We have some other special funds as well that are geographically restricted. Uh, the Appel Fund is uh, limited to central Pennsylvania. The Bardis True Fund is limited to the eastern shore of Maryland. And the Henry Jordan Fund is um, mid-Atlantic states which are listed on the, on the website. Um, this is this sort of focuses for the protect the Jordan Fund list focuses on the protection of natural and cultural resources and has a deadline of June 15th, June 17th this year because the 15th is on a weekend. Bardis True uh, does allow for brick and mortar work and it has one deadline each year, June 15th. The Appel Fund uh, also allows for brick and mortar but is limited to specific counties in central Pennsylvania and that deadline is March 15th. So for all of these, if you if you are in that geographic region, I, I uh, suggest you go on the website and see um, if that is a grant for you. Um, generally, similar guidelines to uh, to our other funds and uh, restrictions, although um, two of these three do allow for brick and mortar work. So that's sort of quick and dirty on the majority of our funds. Uh, I'm going to talk about the grant process for all of these funds. And then we'll come back and talk about um, a couple of the other larger grant programs that we have that don't uh, tie in as well to the rest of these. So how do you apply? You go uh, online to forum.savingplaces.org slash funding, go through the guidelines, look at the criteria, um, look up what deadlines are coming up. And then at the bottom of that page, you'll find a link to Foundant, which is our online grant portal. Uh, everything has to be submitted through this portal. Um, things that you will need include letters of endorsement, uh, your tax exempt status, uh, a number of other things you can see on the screen and you'll be able to see in the application. It's not a super lengthy application. Um, we, we try to only ask the questions that we, we need to know the information to be able to make the decisions. Um, 
but if you have questions about it, uh, again, contact us. Uh, it, it's generally a pretty good system to work with, I think, for both for us and for our applicants. Uh, the re review process looks like this. Uh, first, the application is checked in by grants office staff for basic eligibility, and at this point, we may follow up with you for clarification or for additional information. And then the applications are reviewed by uh, the grant staff, by National Trust field staff or other staff, sometimes by partner organizations, depending on the, the grant fund. Uh, and then the decisions are made by a grants committee, uh, which could be the grant staff and our vice president of field services or a, a grant jury, which could include national trust staff, uh, national trust donors, or an external juror. So this depends on the grant fund, but generally that's um, the process. And then finally, the applicant is notified, uh, typically about eight weeks from the due date, um, though occasionally this will take longer if we uh, for various reasons, we'll try to let you know if that's going to happen. Uh, all of the notifications come out via email, so it's important that when you um, apply, at the top of the, the application page, it'll give you a couple of websites, or a couple of email addresses, rather, to add to your safe list on your, on your email account. We really encourage you to do this because our emails that go through the grant system occasionally get tagged as spam, um, and we don't know for sure if that happened, only you know, <laughs> um, but if if you don't get that email, you don't know what the answer to your, your grant inquiry was. So add those emails, email addresses to your safe list uh, to be sure that your emails are coming through because that is how we notify. We don't send anything out um, as a paper copy. So, you know, we go through this whole process. We'll notify if you got a grant. If, unfortunately, you didn't get a grant, why? Um, this is usually one of the questions that we're often asked when people contact us. And there's a number of reasons, um, but these are sort of the, the main four. Um, the most common reason why you didn't receive a grant is because our funding is limited. Uh, we technically have nationwide coverage, but our grant funding comes from uh, geographically restricted endowed funds. Uh, so the different, different locations, depending on what state you're in, where you are, have um, different amounts of money and can be more or less competitive based on that. Um, the second reason is that there weren't uh, the correct amount of matching funds. So you have to have that one-to-one -one cash match. If you don't have a, a match at all, we can't fund your project. If you don't have enough of a, of a match, we may fund a smaller portion of your project. Um, and this sometimes happens for that first reason as well. You may get a smaller grant than you requested because we didn't have, enough, we didn't have the, the, the funds to fund your full project, but we still wanted to give you a partially funded grant. Um, so those are the two top region, reasons. Um, the, the third reason is that your project doesn't meet our guidelines um, or you don't have enough eligible expenses. So our grant pages list all of the ineligible expenses that we cannot pay for. Um, and that, uh, that's a, kind of a big reason why you get a smaller grant or not a grant at all. And, and something that's not always clear to people is, is that that eligible expenses portion of it. Um, so for example, you, you have to have enough of them that both our grant and the match to our grant would cover the eligible expenses. So if you have a $10,000 project and you're asking us for a $5,000 grant, that's great. You have $5,000 in matching funds that you've gotten from a local foundation, hooray. Um, so then you have the cash match, that's great. You're, you're going, going forward just right. Um, but if $5,000 of your project is to hire an architect to create drawings for you and $5,000 is for the contractor to do the work for the building and you were applying to the preservation fund, you would only be eligible for a $2,500 grant because only $5,000 of your expenses were eligible. So that's uh, what, where um, people often get a little tripped up. Uh, we, and that's Part, one of the one of the reasons why you may not have received a grant or you may not have received full funding. Um, and then finally, your project may just not have been the right fit. Uh, if it's not preserva preservation focused, if it sort of just has a general history bent, um, we're less likely to fund it or not going to fund it. We see this more with education programs than with uh, actual building related projects just because of the nature of the project. Um, but it also, you know, might not be the right fit. So that's, you know, it's not the right fit for you or for us rather, but it may not be the right fit for you. If you're working on an educational project, but the photos you send us show that the roof is about to cave in 
we may wonder why you're not working on that portion of the project rather than um, the one you apply for. So if there is something like that where perhaps you're working on multiple projects at once and you maybe have funding for a, another project uh, through other sources but uh, are applying for another portion, it may be, it's good to mention that to us as well just so that we uh, aren't confused about why you're applying. So again, you know, reach out to us before you apply. We can talk through your projects to see if it makes sense for our funds. Um, sometimes the, the timing is just off. We've, you know, we may have spent all of our funding for the year. Our um, uh, fiscal year cycle runs uh, July 1st to June 30th. So the uh, February round is right in the middle of that. The October round is our first round of the year. So by June, by the June round, sometimes we are out of money in certain areas. Other times that means we want to spend the money before the, the fiscal year is up. So it can go either way, uh, but we, you know, we encourage you to come back with another application if you don't, you know, don't get selected the first time. Um, and also consider one of our special funds. We may recommend this to you or we may just consider that ourselves and transfer the application over. Usually you need to do that yourself, um, but you know, we're happy to, to do that if that makes sense for you. So that was a lot of information about many of our grant funds, um, but now I want to just talk quickly about two of our newest grant programs, uh, the first being the African American Cultural Heritage Action Fund grant, which we just had our first round of last year, um, and we're, we're right getting ramped up to, um, to have our second year of these grants. So this is separated from the rest of the grants in this presentation because it's really a, a different program. Um, the, the National Trust for Historic Preservation's African American Cultural Action Fund grants are designed to, to advance ongoing preservation activities for historic places such as sites, museums, landscapes, um, but places that represent African American cultural heritage. And the fund itself is different from our other grants in that it has a two-step application process. It starts with a letter of intent or LOI phase. Uh, so it begins with this LOI where, where folks apply to this and from those applications we narrow it down and invite a much smaller group to uh, submit a full application. Uh, we have four categories that, that applications can be received in, capital projects, project planning, organizational capacity building, and program and interpretation. Um, and this is, like I said, only the second year we've had this grant fund and we expect it to be very competitive. It was very competitive last year. Last year we received 830 letters of intent uh, and we invited 50 organizations to submit applications, and then we were ultimately able to grant to 16 organizations. So these are larger grants, $50,000 to $150,000, and uh, we welcome your letter of intent. Again, we can we can talk about this too, but uh, on the phone, by email. Uh, I'd also encourage you to go to this website here that's listed on the screen, or just Google African American Cultural Heritage Action Fund Grants, and you'll get to our site. Um, to see sort of the 16 projects that we chose last year that, that can be helpful in helping you sort of see what we were looking for and what we were, what we were interested in. Um, the letter of intent is due January 15th. This process is open now for those letters of intent. Uh, we plan to notify everyone by March 25th of if they were selected to move on to the application phase or not. The applications are due May 1st, and this isn't on here because I think I ran out of room, but um, notifications on the applications will come out late June or early July. So that's the action fund as I shortened it to in my brain because African American Cultural Heritage Action Fund is a mouthful. Um, another fund we have is actually a fund we share with a partner organization and this is the National Fund for Sacred Places. Uh, this provides capital funding for houses of worship and it's a partnership between the National Trust and Partners for Sacred Places, who are a great nonprofit group based out of Philadelphia. And uh, this was meant to grant, it's, it's granting a total of $10 million over four years to approximately 50 houses of worship. And we're in our third round of this funding, I think. Um, it sort of blurs together at a, at a point. Um, but congregations must meet certain criteria and they receive training and support from the National Trust and partners for sacred places, and then the opportunity to apply for a capital grant ranging, ranging from $50,000 to $250,000. So there are a lot of 
guidelines and criteria for this fund, I very much encourage you to go to that website and this fund for sacredplaces.org, read over that information. It's, it's really helpful. There's a lot of great sort of tools to, to walk you through your project and your congregation. Um, the LOI is due in April, and that should be opening up relatively soon. And then, again, so this is sort of that two-step process, the letter of intent, the LOI, uh, and then an, where we narrow the applicants down and then invite a smaller group back to submit an application. Uh, and then final notifications for this are due in October. And again, that website lists all of the projects we or the, the congregations we have funded to in our previous cohorts. Um, so you can see there uh, sort of what we're interested in, what we're looking for. Um, we take ultimately about 15 congregations a year for this fund. So it's, it's a good reminder, you know, our ultimate goal is not to be, be Uncle Scrooge uh, and kind of hold all of our grant funds uh, in a vault somewhere. We want to give this money away. So, you know, we want to, to fund your projects. We want to help preservation around the country and help, uh, help people who are doing preservation. So we want to give this money away. <laughs> So please help us do that um, by, you know, putting in your applications and, and emailing us to ask about your projects and reading the guidelines and, um, you know, going through that. Um, so we, we have time for questions now. Uh, you can um, use the chat box, and I think, Michelle, you were going to talk more about that. Yes. Yes. Thank you, Diana. Thank you so much for all this information. As you can tell, Diana is our grants guru. Um, so we're going to start the question and answer portion of the webinar. So again, if you have questions, feel free to type them in on your control bar there. We'll answer as many as we can. So we've already had a couple coming in while Diana was speaking, so thank you everyone for your patience. And so let's answer a couple of these now. And again, if we don't get to your question, don't panic. We will post a blog on our forum, um, or a blog post on our forum blog answering all of these questions. Um, so let's start with, Diana, can you receive funding for same project from both the African American Cultural Heritage Action Fund and the National Trust for Historic Preservation Fund? Uh, yeah, that's, you can. Um, you, since they're separate applications and uh, decided separately, you, you can use that. Um, we, for the, what you can't do is match the funding, match natural, National Trust funding with National Trust funding. So you would need to um, have a different match for your National Trust Preservation Fund, different money on hand. Okay. Next question. Um, does the African American Cultural Heritage Action Fund cover excavation projects? Um, I think I would need to know more about that project to answer that question, um, just because uh, it doesn't cover new construction. If it was archaeological excavation, yes, um, but it, we would need to talk about that more, uh, I think, offline. So if you can send us an email, uh, we'd be happy to answer that. Great. Thank you. Next question. How do you get reviewer feedback from the grant committee? Sure. So you email grants at savingplaces.org, um, and then we will go and see uh, sort of what um, review said and, and let you know uh, what what we hear, what we knew. Wonderful. All right. Um, next question for the Cynthia Woods Mitchell. Is the match financial or are you able to use in-kind as well as financial? Uh, it has to be just money. It can't be an in-kind match. Okay. And you don't, for any of these, you don't have to have the match on hand when you apply, um, but you do need to have it by the time you, you need to pay your contractor at the end. <laughs> okay. Great. Next question. Some of the grant limits, even with matching funds, fall short of the kinds of fees that I see for the studies you've noted as examples. HSRs, NR nominations, condition assessments, etc., often cost in excess of $30,000. Are there exceptions to the funding limits? Do you foresee these limits increasing anytime soon? Um, let's start with that. Yeah, I think that um, this is a grant program that goes back to about 1969, and uh, not a lot has changed really since then, except for the cost of things. Um, so this is something we're actively working on to try to up those limits. Um, it, it's going to take a little bit of time. We've tried to sort of, we've been able to bump up some, like the, the Favreau Fund and the Mitchell Fund, working with our donors to, to bump that amount up. 
some of them it's really hard for us because we don't have a lot of money in some of these grant funds. So it's difficult for us to give a $10,000 grant for a fund that only, you know, gives us $3,000 a year. Um, generally, there are not, uh, you know, we have to stick pretty close to those guidelines, um, but we are sort of working on this to try to see if there's a way that we can can use these better uh, to help better. And, you know, a, a lot of times we're only one piece of that, of that puzzle uh, in terms of the funding. All right. Next question coming in, if a grant application is turned down, is it possible to resubmit essentially the same grant but with improvements? Yes, you're, you're going to need to fill out the application again. We can't just uh, look at the same uh, uh, application, but you can, you, as, as within our program, you have access to everything that's been submitted from your organization. So uh, you can go back and you could copy and paste over um, things that uh, you know, worry there. Think something like the, the history of the site probably hasn't changed since you submitted it last, things like that. You could copy and paste over. Let's see. We're having a lot of great feedback on your presentation, Diana. Looking for the next question. Um, let's ask this one. Tell us a little bit more about the letter of intent. Should the letter show the history, the needs for facilities, and et cetera? Yeah, so the, the letter of intent is actually, like I said, it's an online form. So it has questions that you need to answer. Um, so it will ask sort of, you know, what is the uh, what is the history of your site? What project are you looking to do um, for the, the, I'm assuming you're ac asking about the Action Fund. Uh, you may be asking about the Sacred Places Fund, in which case Sacred Places Fund will ask about your congregation as well. Um, but all of those questions are there. It's not something where you're writing a letter to us. It's you're filling out this form and attaching the documents that we're requesting as well. Great. And I just want to say to a couple of our listeners that if you're looking for copy, a copy of the PowerPoint on your control bar, you should see an option that says Handouts. That should be on, on the right side of your screen if you haven't moved it. Again, you'll see Handouts. And if you click the little arrow, there's a National Trust Grants PDF for you to download. And that's all the slides Diana was using today. So no worries. We'll get that to you. Um, let's see. Um, how about this one? Can we apply for the African American Cultural Heritage Action Fund grant and one for something else from the HPS? Um, from the Preservation Fund, yes. You can, you can apply for two projects. Uh, we can grant up to three, three grants in a two-year period for any organization. So that could be any of our, any of our funds or any of our um, grants. Great. Here's another one. If an organization focuses on historical places, um, focused on black history in Oregon, uh, is that considered a landscape? Uh, last year's funding focused on buildings in one historic district. So this sounds like somebody has gone online and looked at those prior mm -hmm. projects, Diana. Yeah, um, I think that would be a landscape. Uh, it would be an area. I think it would, um, it's still a place. You know, uh, we, we try to give as many examples of, as possible of what we mean by place. We can't get all of them in there. Um, but I think that, that that would be included, yeah. Okay. Next question. Does the NTHP provide any links to recommend consultants for things like an HSR, or do we have to do that research on our own? Yeah, we, we don't. Um, I think once upon a time, before my time here, we did. Um, I think a lot of times we don't necessarily know who's in, in your area. Um, so we would encourage you to go to either your state historic preservation office or uh, probably your, your statewide preservation organization to get um, more examples of, of local folks. I personally don't, don't have that information. Um, so we would recommend that you reach out to somebody local closer to you. Okay. Uh, here's a question. Do you no longer have the Gwen Turner Fund as an active funding program? So that's included in the National Trust Preservation Funds. Uh, a little bit of history. There were uh, the way that the grant fund used to be run. Um, they were kind of called. Many funds were called out specifically in different areas. Um, the Gwen Turner Fund is in Alabama, um, and that is just included in the National Trust Preservation Fund. So that's the application you would submit. Okay. Next question, are there templates or strong examples that we can use when drafting letters of intent? 
We don't release that information. Um, we, we don't have that available. I think that uh, everybody's project is so different that it wouldn't really be a, a good example. Uh, I, I think that would be hard kind of apples to apples comparison. Um, I think you just kind of have to do the best you can, be as clear as you can. Remember that, um, you know, we may not know what your, you may, you may be very familiar with your project, but we aren't necessarily familiar. So it's helpful to give us sort of that, that background of what it is and what you're trying to do and just be as clear as you can. Um, and in the letters of intent this year, one of the things we're asking is sort of how far in the planning process you are. We, we found last year that we weren't sure, you know, where people's projects were, you know, if it's, if it's just a grand idea, if it's um, something that you, you know, talk to consultants and have budgets for and things like that. So we've added that question to the letter of intent this year as well to see, you know, what, where you are in that planning process of, of doing this project. All right, great. The next question coming in, is National Trust funding only available for buildings or can projects that preserve, say, historic vessels listed on the National Register um, of historic vessels apply for any of these funds? Yep, vessels could, could apply. We've, we've given grants to ships um, in the past, uh, to train cars, um, you know, it's easier just to say places, but uh, transportation vehicles, I guess, uh, can be included as well. Okay, let's see. Um, all right. I noticed the previous ED did not complete the follow-up info from a previous grant received. Will I be able to submit a new request, or will I have to figure out the outcome info from the previous grant received? That's a good question. And... Um, if you have any sort of, uh, send us an email basically with your organization, but generally if, if you're coming into a situation where, uh, you know, the person's no longer there, you have no knowledge of the project, uh, we can work with you to try to just get some sort of basis of, of what was done. Um, sometimes, you know, there's, depending on your project, there may be money, additional funding tied to a final report. So that's why I encourage you to email us so that we can make sure that, you know, you're getting the full grant amount. Um, but if it is just one of our preservation fund grants, you know, we do like to have everything closed out before and so that you're up to date and in good standing, your organization is. But we understand that you may be coming into something where you have limited knowledge of the project. Um, so if we can just uh, kind of work through that with you um, and get it taken care of, so just send us an email. Great. Next question, do sacred places include Indian petroglyph sites and other such sacred sites? Um, they generally do not. Um, send us an email and, and let's talk about your project. The funding that we received for this grant has limited it to um, Christian congregations uh, and we have a little bit of more money that can be used for um, non-Christian congregations. So uh, send us an email, let's talk through your project and, and um, we can go from there. All right, next question. If we're applying for a project in progress, can we use the architect already involved or will we have to get quotes to start with a new firm? The cost won't reach $50,000. Generally, no. Um, we do need to sign off on your consultant before we can uh, send you a grant agreement. So. Um, you know, we'd like that you sort of have done your due diligence in terms of making sure that you have, uh, you know, bids that are reasonable or, or what you need to do. But we understand that, you know, some places um, you may need, there may only be one person who can do this work. Um, and, and we can grant, uh, you know, we're okay with that. Um, just we want to talk about the situation. So put that person's name on your application. Most likely it'll be fine. Um, hopefully you're using someone who has preservation experience uh, and, um, you know, we have no problem approving them. Okay. Next question. Are there priorities within the African American Cultural Heritage Action Fund for addressing particular aspects of African American cultural heritage? Um, not quite yet. Um, that may be more information that comes out. I think right now that there are not. Okay. Uh, here was, is what seems to be a follow-up to an earlier question. If you apply for a transportation vehicle, does it have to be listed on the National Register to be eligible for a grant from the National Trust? 
Uh, it doesn't. Nothing, uh, your, any project does not have to be designated. Um, it's helpful if they are. It sort of gives you a starting point, um, especially for the historic significance of the project. Uh, just having to, you know, having that information on hand helps you there, but nothing, building, ship, you know, train car, uh, landscape does not, it, they don't have to have any kind of designation to be eligible for the fund, any of our funds. Okay. Again, uh, for the African American Cultural Heritage Action Fund, will grant funding help historic African American neighborhoods doing minor rehabilitation projects their historic houses count? So in lieu of one building, can we help multiple historic houses? Yeah, um, we could do that. And it would sort of be, you'd be applying, I think, for a community, for a street, something like that, that that would be eligible. I think um, one of our projects from last year, it wasn't a capital project, but it was an interpretive project uh, in Nebraska was focused on different black homesteading sites. So that's sort of the type of thing where you're looking at a, a number of places that were not, you know, all in the same geographic place other than being in Nebraska. Um, but with a project we funded. Awesome, thank you. Another question, can a separate non-religious NPO whose mission is to preserve and operate a church building apply for a sacred spaces grant on behalf of a congregation slash building or can only the congregation apply? So as long as the preservation organization is related to the congregation, yes. So we see a number of congregations where they have a friends group generally that works on the preservation of the building and, and raises money for them. In that case, yes, but the, the church still needs to have an active congregation related to it, still needs to be an active church. Okay, let's see. A lot of great questions here, everybody. Thank you for staying so engaged. Here's another one, Diana, also with the Action Fund. Is there an average dollar request for the African American Cultural Heritage Action Fund? Um, I think generally people ask for the, the largest amount um, that was available. Uh, we have some sort of sliding ranges that are on the website, uh, depending on which category you're applying with, those, those amounts are different. So I would look there and I would say, we noticed last year, you know, a lot of people were applying for the maximum amount, that 150,000. Uh, and it was unclear if, um, if those numbers, again, I had mentioned earlier, you know, we were asking where folks were in the planning process. Um, partially because it was unclear if, if all of that money was really needed or if it was just being asked for because it, it was the maximum amount. So the more specific you can be, I think the more helpful it is to us. Um, we wanted to, ended up wanting to fund more projects that um, with the, the amount of funding we had available last year. So very few of them got the full ask that they had. So if you can be pretty specific about what you're asking for and, and the more you know about the real actual cost of it as you're submitting these applications, that's really helpful to us. Great. All right, let's see. Next one. Could you describe the top three things you're looking for in the three letters of endorsement required for applications? I believe that's for the Action Fund. Um, it's probably for any of them. Uh, the Preservation Fund uh, asks for these as well. Uh, I don't know if I can give you the top three. Um, I can say it's more helpful if it's from a person that actually knows your organization. Um, you know, having sort of a, a generic letter from your congressional office it doesn't really help us that much. Um, but if you have a partner that knows your work or that knows the project really well, that's helpful. Um, if it's somebody you received a grant from before, uh, that can be helpful as well uh, in terms of uh, kind of showing uh, that your organization has um, done good work and, you know, uh, can, can manage a grant well. Um, yeah, I think that that's the biggest one is it's sort of the more, uh, the more the, the, the letter, the person writing the letter knows, uh, a, about you, I think is more, is more useful to us than just sort of having a big name there. Okay. Let's see. Next question. Um, okay. Here, here's a question. What grant would be best for the restoration and preservation of a currently empty African-American church building? That's a good question. Um, if it does not, if the church building does not have a congregation actively attending it, it wouldn't be eligible for the Sacred Places Fund. So my um, first suggestion would be the, the African-American 
Cultural Heritage Action Fund. Uh, if it's in very early stages where you may need a feasibility study or a historic structures report, uh, it may be the best place would be the National Trust Preservation Fund. Um, again, that's a lot smaller money, um, but could, could get you started. Uh, I would say probably I would apply for the action fund and see where that comes down and then maybe also apply in the February or June round for the preservation fund, uh, especially if the smaller preservation fund grants could, you know, build up on something for the action fund grant. Okay. We'll let Diana take a, a small breath here and I'll remind <laughs> everyone once again on the right side of your screen where your um, toolbar should be that you've been using to attend the webinar today. You can find a, power, a PDF copy of Diana's PowerPoint. It's under handouts. If you click the small arrow, it will show you a downloadable PDF right there on the screen. If you're having trouble seeing this PDF, it will be added along with the recording to our website, which is forum.savingplaces.org. I will show that information at the end of the webinar, but we have a couple more minutes left for questions. So Diana, if you've taken a breath, okay, yeah. next question. Uh, does the African American Cultural Heritage Fund require a match? It does not require a match. However, um, we like to see one. So if you can get a match, even if it's not a full match, um, to show that you know you have uh, other interested parties um, and, and funders, that's, that's great. And that we will, and we, we say this in the guidelines, we do you know kind of not officially score them higher because there isn't a real way to score that, but um, they do get a boost uh, in our eyes by having a match. All right, next question. Would a project focused on building organizational capacity to implement a comprehensive program aimed at preserving African American culture and community building be eligible, especially if it isn't focused on an edifice? Um, possibly. Uh, I think I would want you to email us with more specifics on that. Um, I don't want to give a yes or no answer without having more specifics, but um, send us an email. Okay. Next question. Would any of your funds be suitable for legal costs, say, to obtain ownership of a long closed and abandoned African American church and the related cemetery? Possibly. Um, the preservation fund could, could be used for this, probably would be the best option. Um, the only sticking point we have with legal funds is that our law department has to review them. They have to be able to fit in with our sort of internal guidelines there. So. One of the things I know that we can't pay for are um, straight sort of lawyer's fees. Um, the, our department feels that it's not, that's something that, you know, you could go down a rabbit hole and just be spending thousands and thousands of dollars um, and there's no, no sort of, you know, limit to that. So uh, generally anything associated with legal fees, it's, it's sort of a set cost. So it may be for something like um, hiring an expert witness um, or or um, court filing fees or things like that that are sort of a set amount. Um, but we can do that, and sometimes our emergency funds help with this uh, as well. Uh, but the preservation fund would probably be your best bet there. Okay. Here's another question. Is it mandatory to have a photo, name, and location of the project published to the public? Can the site remain anonymous? Um, if it's something, uh, I think we run into this with some sacred plate, sacred sites, uh, Native American sites. It doesn't have to be public. Uh, we need to we need to see it. If it if it's something that needs to be a not if that can't be released publicly though, you need to tell us that and be very clear um, about what uh, what can be shown and what cannot be shown um, in your application. Okay, and I believe that woman also followed up saying specific to the action fund. Uh, same same for the action fund as well. Um, yeah, you just need to make sure, let us know what what that is, and it's helpful if you can tell us why as well. Okay, I'm um, because generally we do, you know, you'll see on the last, or if you go to the website and see the project from last year, you know, there is a there is a fair amount of marketing that goes with this at the at the when the funds when the the projects are announced. So that's going to be difficult to do if we don't have any kind of photo. Um, so there might just be some work that has to happen around that. Okay. This is, this is an easy one, Diana. Um, a woman is asking, could you please repeat how many LOIs you received for the action fund last year and how many were invited to the full proposal? Yep. We received 830 
um, letters of intent LOIs, and we received uh, we invited 50 uh, 50 back to submit full applications. And we have no idea how many are going to come in this year, but we do anticipate a similar inviting a similar amount uh, to submit full applications. Okay. Next question: Are any funds available for flow through grants? Um, I'm not exactly sure what you mean about that, but if you mean sort of re-granting to other organizations, um, maybe. <laughs> um, that's not something we do a lot of. Uh, I'm trying to think if there's examples of that. Um, there might not be, but again, I think the, until the last couple of years, the majority of our funds have been such smaller amounts that they don't really make sense uh, to do that. And our guidelines are such that um, that might not work depending on what the project was. If you have a specific project in mind, send us an email. Um, sometimes hypotheticals are hard for me to figure out <laughs> unless I have specifics. Um, so that would be helpful there. Okay, now Diana, we have time for one more quick question and then we're gonna wrap things up everybody. But again, these uh, answers will be posted on our forum blog. So last question here. Do sacred places require a match? Sacred places do require a match. Um, definitely go on the website, check that out. Depending on the dollar amount, it's either a one-to-one -one or a two-to-one um, cash match. So uh, that would mean if it's a, if you're receiving a larger grant amount, then you have to have an even larger amount to match it. So lots more descriptions on that website. Um, I would encourage you to go check that out. But yes, they do require a match. Okay, everybody. So, just reason up. Doesn't want to go. Hmm. Oh, okay. Go. Oh, there we go. Yep. So, um, thank you guys, everybody. Uh, before I hand this back to Michelle, that's our contact information. You can also find that on our website. Uh, I would imagine if you Google National Trust Grants, uh, you will be able to get to this information at some point too. Like I said, we're always happy to talk to people. Oops, sorry. And uh, you can also send us an email. It's, that's probably the easiest way to reach us. The email. But Michelle, back to hey, you. Back, back to me. <laughs> Thank you, Diana. Well, everybody who's still on the line, there are some upcoming webinars if you enjoyed today's content. So we have two scheduled in January 2019. We have one on the 17th that will focus on opportunity zones and the preservation community. We also have one on January 30th that will focus on the Rosenwald School GIS project that was recently completed here at the Trust through a grant uh, that we received through the National Park Service. So those should both be great. Um, for more information on those upcoming webinars and to register, you can go to our website, forum.savingplaces.org slash forum webinar. And then, let's see. There, to wrap up, I would like to thank Diana so much for taking the time to prepare today's webinar and being with us all today and for answering so many questions. And we have more work for Diana as she'll answer the rest of the questions we weren't able to get to today. So again, thank you so much. All right, again, this webinar has been brought to you all by the Preservation Leadership Forum. You can learn more about us on our website. Um, and that's all for today. Thanks, everybody. Happy holidays.